All right, so in this video, we're going to be solving some problems that involve algebraic manipulation of complex numbers. So we already defined a complex numbers one having a real part, A, and an imaginary part, B. And we also talked about the polar form representation, which is essentially the magnitude of the complex number set times the exponential function i to the power of theta. So there's another thing that uh, we need to define right now, and it is what uh, the Euler identity is. So the Euler identity is probably one of the very fundamental concepts of complex numbers, and it is very important that we know what it what it is. So it tells you that if you have some complex number or essentially a quantity of an exponential function to the power of some complex um, theta, this is the same as expressing it as a combination of cosine plus a sine function. But that sine function is going to have an i attached to it. So that's the imaginary unit that we defined as the square root of minus 1. So you can pretty much express this as a combination of those two things. And this will become very useful in um, a few videos later on when we actually use something called the Moivre's theorem to deduce an, um, an expression for cosine square of theta as a function of cosine 2 theta plus some other terms. So that's something that we can use this definition of the Euler and the identity to work out. So before we go to that particular stage or to that phase, we're going to focus on what it is. So say you have some exponential that is written as this. So now the only thing that is going to change is that sign at the front there. So it is going to stay the same cosine theta minus i sine theta. So there's something very interesting that happens here because that means that if you add these two numbers together, so e to the power of plus e to the minus i theta, what happens when you add these two quantities together? Well, this and this cancel out, so you're left with 2 times cosine of theta. And that means that you can essentially express your, um, your general function cosine of theta as a sum of complex exponentials. So this is an expression that you might see pop up quite often in complex numbers. And in a similar manner, if you subtract one from the other, so let's say we subtract this one from that one, this sign is going to become positive, so these two numbers are going to add together, wh whereas the cosines are going to cancel. So in the end, you can express your sine, sine of theta, can also be expressed in terms of um, complex exponentials. But the only difference now is that it is going to be expressed as follows. So that's going to be minus e to the power of minus i theta. So they look very similar. The only difference is this i at the denominator here, and then there's this minus instead of plus. But that's a really important definition to make, is that cosine and sine you can express in terms of those complex exponentials. And that means that what is tan of theta going to be? In that case, well, we know tan, tan of theta is going to be sine of theta over cosine of theta. Let me just scroll down a little bit. I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. So what's this going to be? Well, the half and the half are going to cancel out. This i is going to tend. This is going to be written at the top, so that's going to go to the bottom. And then we're going to have this at the bottom. That's i theta plus e to the i theta. And this is going to be minus. But in general, we don't like having the imaginary unit in the denominator of a fraction like this. So there's a way that we can use that is the same, the same concept that we use with search. So if you have a, um, a, a square root of a number at the denominator of a fraction, what you can do is you can multiply that fraction by that same root such that you get rid of it in the denominator and then you're left with it on the numerator because you're basically squaring it. The same thing can be used with a imaginary number. So if you have 
1 over i that's the same as saying um, 1 over i times i over i and this is basically going to become i over i squared which is minus 1 so this is minus i so this is another very important definition to make so having defined the uh, imaginary unit as that or, th or the inverse imaginary unit as this what we're going to do now is we're going to perform some operations on complex numbers and we're going to see some of the different methods that we can apply we're going to see that expressing it in different forms can actually help us simplify the problem um, significantly so we have a choice of two forms so the first one is the original one I presented to you which is a plus or minus i beta and this is called the Cartesian form and the second one is essentially the polar form which is this so that one is called the polar form and this one is on the magnitude of the complex number is sometimes represented as r because if you if you consider a complex number it is always drawn from the origin to whatever point it is uh, going to according to those Cartesian coordinates so it is sort of like the radius of a circle so that's why sometimes they call it r so this may be written as r e to the i theta both definitions are the same it doesn't matter what you call it but it is just a matter of choice so let's say we want to add two complex numbers together what are we going to have well we're going to have obviously the real parts are going to add together because remember we cannot really combine complex and imaginary parts so we're going to have b1 plus b2 so complex goes with complex imaginary and real with real or in a um, better definition would be imaginary part goes with imaginary because complex refers to the whole thing and what what if we have minus well if we have minus that's the same thing it's not really going to be um, very very different in fact it's just going to be subtracting the two quantities together in the end so what we're going to do now is we're going to say we have we want to multiply two complex numbers together so we're going to have set one times set two and uh, what will we do in that case well normally we could expand the products of those so we could have a plus or minus so a1 ib1 a2 plus or minus ib2 and if we want the Cartesian form of this that will become a1 a2 and then we could expand that so let's say we just want to have a very generic expression so I'm just gonna call this plus because for that that just accounts for both negative and positive so let's have this so what is this going to become we are going to have a1 times a2 then we're going to have plus i b2 times a1 plus i b1 times a2 plus i times i is i squared which is minus 1 so that's actually going to be a minus so that's going to be minus b1 times b2 and then if we group things together we're going to have the real parts a1 a2 plus or in this case it's minus b1 b2 plus the imaginary part which is b1 a2 plus i b2 a1 and the really interesting thing about this is that you notice that even though we were both of them were all positive numbers we ended up with a negative quantity here in the real part and that's something you would never get from adding real numbers so that's why it's so important from multiplying complex uh, real numbers so that's a very important thing that we need to consider as well now what if we wanted to express this in polar form well in that case for the multiplication what we would have is the following we would have r1 times r2 
e to the power of i theta 1 times e to the power of i theta 2. And remember, for exponentials or powers of the same base, we just add the powers together. So that's going to be r1, r2, e to the power of i plus theta 2. And the same thing can be applied for two complex numbers. So set 1 over set 2, if we use the polar form, it's actually quite easy. We just have r1 over r2, and that's going to be theta 1 minus theta 2, because remember, when you divide two powers of the same base, we just subtract the powers. And that's going to be your expression for that. Alternatively, you could perform this operation in Cartesian form. So let's have this in Cartesian form. That's going to be a1 plus i b1 over a2 plus i over b2. And remember we say we don't like having imaginary units in our denominator. So what we can do is we can multiply this whole expression by the complex conjugate of this. Um, so the complex conjugate is the same thing we would have with a third. So let's say we have something in the denominator like this. What we would do is we would multiply that by um, an expression that is the same, but the sign attached to that square root is going to be the opposite. So the concept is the same. So we use something called the complex conjugate in this case, and it is denoted by an asterisk on as a power, but it's not really a power, it's just an, a notation that we use. And it is essentially inverting the sign of the imaginary part. So instead of having, having that plus, we're going to have the minus b2. So that's what the complex conjugate of a complex number is. So we're going to have a2 minus i b2, a2 minus i b2. And now I'm going to erase this thing right here. And then we can expand this out so we know what are we going to have here. Well, we're going to have something similar to this. So we're going to have a1, a2, now minus i, b2, a1, plus i, b1, a2. Now we have minus times i times i. So i squared is equal to minus 1. And minus 1 times minus 1 is going to be plus 1. So that's going to be plus b1, b2. And all of this is going to be over a2 squared. Remember, because we have that minus here, we don't have any term in the middle. And then we're going to have what? We're going to have plus b, squ b squared. So that's going to be our, um, our Cartesian form of that complex number. And if you wanted to go further, you can separate the real from the imaginary part and then apply the denominator to that. So if we wanted to expand that out, we could write it as the following. So set 1 over set 2 in Cartesian form would be a squared 2 plus b squared 2. And that's going to go over the following. So we combine the real parts together, which is a1, a2 plus b1, a b2. plus the imaginary part, which is going to be, once again, a2 squared plus b2 squared. And now the imaginary part is going to be b1 a2 minus b2 a1. And hopefully that doesn't confuse you too much, but that's essentially what we will represent the complex number as. And just as a final remark, so that's just about all the operations we can perform with complex numbers. Just as a final remark of this whole video, I'm going to say that you can always get back from the polar form, so r e to the power of i theta, back to the Cartesian form by simply putting that value into your cosine and sine like that. Oops, that should be, I don't know why I wrote that there. That should be a B, right? All right, so that makes it better. So that means that in essence, our A is going to be equal to R cos theta. And our B 
is going to be equal to r sine theta. So that's another very interesting thing that you can do with that. So knowing what the angle is, you can find those a and b components to write the Cartesian form. So when adding them, it is often convenient to use this form. When multiplying or dividing, it is more convenient to use the polar form. And using those things is quite useful for the things that we'll be doing in the next videos. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to introduce you to some more theorems and some more identities that you can um, use to your advantage for simplifying expressions. And after that, we're going to get started on more graphs of complex regions on the complex plane. And after that, we'll get to functions of a complex variable, which is what this series is going to be focusing mostly on.